Good morning, Sally. How are you today? I'm so good, Michelle. Thank you. How are you? I am so good. Um, I'm so grateful that our mutual friend, Lauren Walker uh, from Parish LA had introduced us. Parish right now. That's right. Yes. We're wearing it through and through. Do you have the red thread? Show me the red thread. I know it. What makes it unique? That's right. Oh my gosh, it's so awesome. So what I love about uh, interviewing people for Opportunity Knocks is I feel so blessed that I'm in the presence of so many super talented individuals. And in today's um, actual podcast, what's amazing is you are the first actress that I'm interviewing. What? A podcast in LA and I'm the first actress? I know. Isn't that amazing? So the interesting thing is, you know, I started my career in entertainment um, on the entertainment marketing and distribution side. However, I quickly moved out of entertainment about five years into that. But, and I know so many actors and actresses, but I actually, I don't know. I never thought about interviewing them, but... I'm thrilled to be the first. And I'm honored that you're the first, Sally. Wow. So, um, and by the way, because every person that I interview for Opportunity Knocks comes by way of referral, frankly, that's how you came to me. I was like, well, duh, why wouldn't I interview a successful actress? <laughs> well, thank you. And um, I feel like if you know Lauren, you're like, listen, what, whoever you like, whatever you want me to do, whatever you ask me to do, I will do it. Like not even a question. And then I listened to a bunch of your podcasts, including your podcast with Lauren. And despite the fact that I consider her one of my close friends, there were so many things that you uncovered mm -hmm. and discussed with her that I didn't even know about. And, mm -hmm. um, I, it, you know, you and I were on the phone for well, like, like over an hour. hour. Yeah. Exactly. Like over an hour. I was on my way driving somewhere and I was like, this lady is so interesting. We could talk for two hours. I mean, I think I picked up my UPS. I picked up one of my kids. I dropped one of my kids off and we were still talking. Um, and, and, we my, and my beeping thing in my car was still there. Really beeping thing in your car. Yeah, exactly. But the thing is, if you could overcome the beeping sound in my car and drive for me from the with me from the west side to the South Bay, <laughs> that's literally what we did as I was in traffic. That's true. That's right. You were like, I have a long drive, so we probably won't make it. And then you literally had to get off because you got where you were going. Exactly. And we were still yippee yapping, chitty chattying. Yep. And we had to book this in order to continue yippee yappy, chitty chattying. Exactly. So thank God for that. So anyways, I want to introduce our listeners to you, um, uh, our listeners from Opportunity Knox. And Sally Pressman is an actress, and she's not just any actress. She's literally had so many successful roles. I actually don't even know where to focus you. <laughs> I literally had to say, uh, okay, so what are the three things you want me to hit on? Because I'm afraid that I don't know how to go through your three pages of your resume. <laughs> because she's 25. Yes. Yes, I am. That's right. And I did so much in my 25 years. Exactly. Exactly. And it just keeps getting greater, right? <laughs> yes. So uh, Sally Pressman, actually, I just want to hit on three things that I know that uh, she's done that are super impressive. But in addition, she's going to take us through a little bit about her background and her growing up in New York City and, and all of the really juicy stuff, as we know. The team. So, <laughs> so Sally uh, was an actress on The Army Wife. She also uh, was Ellis in Grey's Anatomy. And who doesn't love Grey's Anatomy? I think I watched every single episode for quite a while there. Yeah, for quite a while. Probably not through season 19, but a ton of people have watched through season 19. I have to tell you, because I have young children, I think I have had to watch it through season 19. Oh, really? Yes. They're, like, addicted. You oh, know? That's so you go from like the beginning to the end and there's like they binge watch. Um yes. I love watching. I mean, I think a lot of people binge watch. I don't binge watch. I love it. I love it. I um recently I, I recently binge watched um Handmaid's Tale because mm. I had to put it away for a while after my daughter was born mm. and I missed like two seasons. And mm. I was like, "Oh god, okay, you know what? I'm just going to do this because I I, I just have to. I'm going to do it." And I binged like two seasons of Handmaid's Tale, which is almost. How did that take you? 
How long did it take me? Um, it took a very pleasant two weeks because okay. I, I'm not one of those who will like stay up until 1 a.m. Yes. thing. Like I have a very strict TV off by 10 max. Oh, that. Um, and uh, so I, it, it, I really drew it out. There were a couple days where I was like folding laundry mm -hmm. and watching I'm it. I'm impressed. Do you fold your own laundry? Oh, yes. I do all of my own laundry. And wow. I'm constantly doing Sally, it. that yes. is impressive. Well, thank you. My mom doesn't think it's that impressive. She's like, I did that. <laughs> I'm doing that. But I have to say, you know what? I go in and out of it. I do like the way I fold my own stuff, but I have to say I, I don't really do it very often. Well, you know, I... Um, children, did you have children? I have, I have two. That's what I thought. Yes. Yeah, so I don't know, for me, like as the piles got bigger, it got too overwhelming. I, I hear you. I was like, I had a very strict schedule during pandemic of like every three days I was doing laundry. And then I think you're right. As the kids get older, the amount of laundry they generate per day. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I actually don't understand why. Well, because they try things on and they just throw it in the dirty laundry. It, let's face it. Yes, they do. And there are times when my son will be like reaching for a pair of shorts and he'll knock two other shorts down and his hampers right underneath. Yes. So those perfectly clean shorts that have now landed in his hamper yes. that then end up being like, how did, what? You're like, how did you know? So I just do it. I yes. just, I just do it. Well, you're, you're a better mom than me because I'd probably actually dump it out and tell them to fold it themselves. Well, but how old are your kids? uh 16 18 and 11. okay michelle it's a very different story if i asked my four-year-old or oh, yeah, no, you can't year old, yeah no 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 i would have to come in there and refold and well no wonder why you look so young by the way if you have a four-year-old it's true i was about to ask you what your skincare regimen was ah uh, well i have a i have a really religious skincare regimen that i believe in like wholeheartedly Ooh, well we'll have to get into that but before we do that and before yes. we go any further it wasn't only just Grey's Anatomy that we needed to actually tell them about, right? What was the last thing you wanted me to tell them about? Um, good uh, girls. These, these were the these were the little hits. Most people know me from Army Wives, yep. um, which was a scripted show. It wasn't unscripted. I am not an Army Wife. I just played one on TV. Um, Army Wives, Ellis Gray, Grey's Anatomy, also a show called Younger. Um, I played Debbie Mazar's Orthodox Jewish girlfriend. Wow. Um, and, um, good girls. Most, good girls. Yeah. Oh, oh, and good girls. Yes. Yeah. That was the one that you just sort of wrapped up. That, you know? just, that finished last year. They just did season four last year and then it, um, you know, it got canceled. Yeah. Well, that's, that's it's actually an interesting, uh, thing being an actress, like, tell me, how did you decide on acting? Because I do want to get into you know, when a show gets canceled and you love the subject line and you love your, you know, your yeah. cast and, and, and everybody that you're with, it must be so hard. I was actually just watching like the whole Modern Family wrap up because that's yes. the show my, my family watches. Yeah. And I was just thinking about how hard it must be to separate it. I mean, it's like a marriage. It, it is like a marriage and a show like Modern Family or like Army Wives. I mean, we did seven seasons of it um, and we shot on location, which means you don't shoot in L.A. You shoot somewhere yeah. else, which um, isolates you from your own family and your friends and your life. So really, the show becomes your family. Um, but uh, it, it, it does become like a family. It's kind of like that feeling, you know, when you went to like sleepaway camp yep. and you would have your like sleepaway camp group of friends and bunk then, mates. yeah, your bunk mates and then camp would be over and you'd go home and there would just be like this hole, this like mm -hmm. aching where you're like, why do I have to wait? For yes. But then there's this, all, this other thing with the sleepaway camp friends where you'll try to like go visit them in the middle of the year or like call them on the phone. You're like, it's not the same. Mm, that's so funny. Like very specific to sleepaway camp. 
Like, yeah, it's very funny that you say that. I was just having a very similar conversation with somebody about football season, right? And Hollywood Bowl season, right? That you have these friends or these groups of friends that you only see at certain times of the year. Yeah. Football season, and then that's it. And it's weird because you're so close to them. Yes. You don't see them at other times. And like you said, when you see them, you're like, this is weird because it's not a football game and it's not the Hollywood Bowl. Totally. Totally. What do we talk about now? Yeah, I don't know what to say. And I'm seeing you outside of our normal atmosphere and context. And I'm like at a loss of how to talk to you. Exactly. But somehow I think for the two of us, we just don't ever lose words. No, no. So were you always talkative? I was. Yeah, I was. And, and going back to your question about how did I choose acting, um, I feel like for most actors, it's almost like we don't choose it. Mm -hmm. um, it's just part of our personality that when we're doing it, um, it feels like you're, if you're playing golf or you're playing tennis, like you're hitting your sweet spot. Mm -hmm. Like you you're know? coming alive? Would you describe yeah, it? Like, like, like it's like it's like you're in your zone and it's like you can be fully yourself and there's something that just like lights you up from within um and that really was always me with performance um i always liked to be the center of attention i always liked people watching me i always liked to be on stage or doing you know skits in my house mm -hmm. with like my parents and my family watching me i always really liked to make people laugh mm -hmm. uh, i always talked loudly mm -hmm. <laughs> um <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I didn't really choose it. It was just the natural extension of who I was. I love that. I really, um, you know, it's like an embodiment, right? Yeah. And um, do you feel that if you don't have that embodiment that, you know, so it's interesting, right? Um, like I became a coach because I feel like I have the ability to serve others and, um and it's something that I'm able to tap deeply, like you talked about, like you learn things about Lauren, because the way I ask questions, the way I listen is like on this level that I bring parts of people out, right? Yes. It's like, I feel like it's inherently who I am, but do you feel like you can, I, I feel like there's a lot of actors or actresses that train, but do they fully embody sometimes? Do you think you're less successful if you don't do that? Or talk to me. I mean, I'm um, you know, success is such an ephemeral thing. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, especially in entertainment, people become successful for a number of reasons. Um, not related to talent always absolutely not related to commitment not related to passion not related to any one of those things unilaterally mm -hmm. so there are people who are incredibly successful and really only wanted to be famous um there are people who are incredibly successful and really only like to get gussied up and be pretty mm. Now, those people aren't going to take roles like what, um, um, why can't I think of her name right now? Um, I can't think of her name, but they aren't going to take roles that are gritty mm -hmm. and not pretty and make you have to strip everything away. Absolutely. Um, they aren't going to take those roles, but they're, those roles will be for the people who are like, I love the craft of it. I love the art of it. Like I think about somebody like uh, when it's not a woman, but I think about Keith Ledger, right? When yeah. he had to really embody that role and it was so yeah. dark, right? Yes. Clearly, um, you know, to maybe perhaps in his demise, you know, but yeah. who knows? But the, the, I don't know enough about the research, but I do think that, um, yeah, there's, I guess what we're saying is, there's many different types of avenues that you can go in the craft, right? Yes. Like I think about people that choose to be, you know, I used to, when I was young, I used to watch the soap operas, right? And yes. that's, uh, K, you know, the Korean soap operas are really big right now, right? And I think I could not see myself doing that. But right. you can wear really cool clothes and- um, And you get beautiful makeup and- yeah. um, 
you know, the thing about soap, op soap operas is um, it's almost like other TV shows or movies, like condensed. Mm -hmm. Like basically a soap opera will cover the amount of drama in a regular movie in a quarter of an episode. And mm -hmm. they'll just cram all the drama in there. And um, shooting a soap opera, it's crazy fast. There's no sitting around and waiting. You shoot like eight episodes a week. Like the pace is, is crazy. I think that's why some, some people may choose to do it because yeah, because it's it, there's something like adrenaline-y and um, no one is sitting around and like milking the craft and like, t you know, needing to get in character. It's mm -hmm. just like boom, boom, boom. Yeah. You know? um, How yeah. did you land your way to television? Um, like why TV versus theatrical? Or well, if theatrical so came around, would you... Like if somebody said, hey, listen, I have this great role for you and, and I, you need to do it. Well, I mean, listen, as an actor, you hear that and you're like, OK, tell me more. Where is it? How much am I getting for it? Who else is involved? What's the story? All of those things. Um, you know, I think for me as an actor, I love playing really deep, interesting multi-dimensional roles on that. shows where like I really believe in and love and am challenged by and feel that the story is very important. Um, that being said, you this work mom balance, especially now being That's a what mom. I was gonna ask you about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, when my husband and I are choosing projects. He's um, also an actor. He's also an actor, yeah. When we when we're choosing projects or when, you know, a project is offered to us, we always have to consider what is this going to take from the family? So yeah. anytime I'm out of, if I'm working, is it out of town? How long am I out of town? And mm -hmm. how much am I making? Um, how does that offset? How does that offset what it's going to require for the other parent to take care of our children and call in reinforcements with um, child care and all of those things? Um, and then there's something where, you know, even the money that you make, the finance of it is offset by the creative and career boosting benefits. So for example, and we always use this as an example, Steven Soderbergh, this incredible, I mean, everyone knows Steven Soderbergh. Yeah. So we always say, um, if Steven Soderbergh calls and it's, everyone knows, like you make no money on a Steven Soderbergh movie. Like mm -hmm. you just don't, it's like a, across the board, universal, you don't make any money. But if Steven Soderbergh calls and is like, I really want you for this role and it shoots in Bulgaria and you're going to make a thousand dollars for the week, but like, it has to be you. You're, uh, I mean, like this, we have said it. We're like, you go, yes. you go and you do the Steven Soderbergh movie because you're getting to be in a Steven Soderbergh movie. And it doesn't matter that we're going to be way out of pocket mm -hmm. to make up for that. Yeah, because it's the experience of it and the ability to say that you work with Steven Soderbergh. Right? Yeah, so like how it's the experience and then it's also what it's going to do for your career. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. It catapults you to the next level. It puts you on the playing field with some of the larger players, right? Exactly. Yeah. So um, that's really interesting. That's a great perspective to have. And I think... I think, you know, you bring up a really good point about being a mother. I didn't realize, I mean, I know we talked about you being a mother before on the phone, but I didn't realize your children were so young. Yeah. And um, how did that come into play when you were making the choice of becoming a mom, uh, of waiting, or was it something that was always like you knew you wanted to be a mom and there was a certain timing for you? That's a really interesting question. Um, I always knew I wanted to be a mom. Like there was no, there was no doubt in my mind. I remember at my mom's, it must've been her 45th birthday. So I was like 10, I think. And um, she had a tarot reader. Yeah. Card reader. That's how my women's group started. That, yep. <laughs> and it was all women. It was an all women's birthday. And she had a tarot card reader. And I remember I was like, oh, I'll, I'll do it. I'm 10 years old. Mm -hmm. And the questions I was asking this woman were, when will I get married? 
when will I have kids? Mm. Those were wow, at 10. Uh, at 10. Those were my okay. questions. Um, I don't remember what you said about the marriage. So obviously she was like within the realm of what I thought, but I remember her saying, you're going to have kids later. You are going to have kids, but you're going to have them later. You're going to do stuff first and then you're going to have them later. My mom, as I said, she had me at 35. She had my brother at 37. She had them later. Mm -hmm. I'm sitting there at 10 and I'm like, nope, nope, Dang. not me. That is not correct. I am going to have them young because I want my parents to be young when they're young. I don't want to be an older parent. I don't want my grandparent. I don't want their grandparents. Do you view your mom as old? Just curious. You know, like some people are older parents, even though they're not that old. I don't, I didn't view my mom as old, but I remember it was around this time when I was eight that my dad's dad died. Mm. My mom's mom had already died. And then I wouldn't, I didn't know it, but shortly after my dad's mom would die. So then I would only be left with one grandparent. Wow. And there must have been something subconscious in me that was like, I don't like this mm -hmm. and I don't want this. Mm -hmm. And I don't want this for myself and I don't want this for my kids. I want everyone to be younger so that we have much more time together. Mm. Cut to, I book my first series, Army Wives, yep. at the age of 24. Wow. I start dating my now husband around the same time. Like I had been dating him for like six months before I booked the show. And I in Los Angeles and we can get to that later. Yes. I was in okay. Los Angeles, booked it in Los Angeles. The show shot in Charleston, South Carolina. So he okay. and I were dating. I would fly to Charleston and shoot the show for anywhere between six to nine months. Wow. Every year, back and forth, back and forth. And um, I convinced him to marry me. And oh, please. We got, we got married. He should be so lucky. I don't even know him, but he should be so lucky. I mean, listen, I told him that. And I also told him, if you don't propose to me by this day, I'm leaving. Mm -hmm. And he proposed to me the day before that day. So. How many years was that? That was, um, he proposed to me and we had been together for five years already. Okay. Yeah, it's time. Yeah. Um, so I was in my last season of the show um, because we were only contracted to shoot for six years. And so I knew that I wanted to do something else after. And also I now had a husband and wanted to start a family and I just didn't want this kind of separation going on. And um, I was on a show. So I had a stable job and we were married and I was like, I need to get pregnant now. Like wow. they, they can't fire you for getting okay. pregnant. They have to mm -hmm. work around it. So the best thing would be for me to get pregnant while I have this I job. Know. Exactly. And then as soon as the show is over, I can have the baby. I can be with the baby and then I can go to the next show. Mm -hmm. Not being pregnant. Yeah. Well, life has Life never plans. goes the way that you yes. want to control or plan it. As Life we. has different plans for you. I would fly my husband out there when I thought I was ovulating. I would fly <laughs> myself back when I thought I was ovulating. I would never be ovulating on that stupid stuff. By the way, I love the fact that you actually say thought because I went through the exact same thing too. Yes. You're trying to control it. You're trying to plan it. Trying to control yes. it. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that stick would never show a happy face. It was thing. never, ever. I was like, how is it that the fertility specialists know when you're ovulating, but you can't figure out that stick? Never. That stick, guys, I would say, throw that stick in the garbage. I totally agree. Um, Let's have more sex. Yes. And just relax. just relax about it. It's yeah. always when people throw away all the stuff that they then get pregnant. Um, so... I didn't get pregnant for the entire run of that show. Got okay. home. So that's seven years. Well, no, this was in the last year. Okay. So this okay, was like for, this was like years. six or seven months that I was out there trying to get pregnant. And the show ended, and I kid you not, the next month I got pregnant. Ooh. The yeah. next month. 
So then I'm going into my first pilot season since I was 24. And at that point I didn't have anything. So no one, like I didn't have any career. So no one cared and pilot season yeah. or anything. And pilot season is when they're like making and creating all the shows. Yeah. My first pilot season, I kid you not, seven and a half months pregnant. Wow. And they can't fire they receive you. They can't fire you for being pregnant, but they definitely don't have to hire, hire you, you for your exactly. pregnant. Um so this is all be, this is all to answer your question about um did I what were my thoughts about um planning to get pregnant? About getting planning to get pregnant. I always knew I wanted to get pregnant. I thought I could have a handle on controlling when. But ultimately, um, I got pregnant when I was supposed to get pregnant and I have my son and like the pregnancy was easy. The labor was easy. We're both healthy. He's amazing. And that's what it was. That's what it was. Yeah. So tell me, you know, bringing up the word control, right? Because the word control or planning or desire or need or pushing, yeah. uh, we know is a very sort of masculine energy. And, um, but it also is what helps so many of us succeed. Yes. Um, what are your thoughts around, because especially like, you know, being an actress, um, there's no control on uh, whether, like you said, when we, when I asked you like, what are the criteria, you know, you could be the most talented person and yet never ever see a television show or a commercial or any of it, right? I know so many people like that. Yeah, and so, I mean, I know that when you are a working actor, actress or artist for that matter, you have you feel so blessed by the opportunity and this is about opportunities right so where does control kind of like fall into this for you or more of a yin flow right um in this process like for example you mentioned like getting pregnant and you wanted to control when you were going to be pregnant. And I know so many people having come from the corporate world, I too have that same perspective of wanting to be able to, you know, deem when I was going to get pregnant. Yes. yes. So, but how does that flow into everyday life and into not just everyday life, but the being an actress? Oh my God. Uh, that is the best question. Like seriously, that is the best question. Um, Thank you. I have like a billion tentacles of answers for that. So I'm going to I love it. consolidate the tentacles. But here's the deal. I'm an incredibly controlling person. I feel most comfortable when I can control everything. Yes. That's who I am. Not every actor is that way. I know a lot of actors who are actually the opposite. Mm -hmm. And I believe that this career really plays into that very well. However, if you don't have that control, if you don't have that need to control, there's also the flip side where you can often just be too loosey goosey. Exactly. And then you lose that drive, that push, that like really aggressive directional ambition. Absolutely. So I would say my husband and I are on opposite sides of the spectrum. Interesting. He's super artsy. He, I mean, look, we can't have two parents, two people in a relationship who like desperately need control, right? So it makes sense. I mean, that you I'm could, right. but it wouldn't be good. It would be terrible. Yeah. Um, if if I married someone who was like me, it would not be a fun household. You might kill him. Yes, exactly. So I gravitated towards someone who who respected and acknowledged um, my need for control, and also wasn't a pushover would be like, okay, there's a, a line at which you can't exactly. come into my zone. Back and off lady. Yes. That's exactly right. At a certain point he goes back off. Yes. That's my zone now. Um, so I'm a, I'm an incredibly controlling person. I like to micromanage everything. Mm -hmm. I, have had to realize to varying degrees um, how little control 
you have over your career if you are an actor. You don't have control over when you get an audition, when you get even an audition. Yeah, that's hard. You don't have control over whether you book that role. You don't have control over what gets seen that you shoot when you do book that role. Exactly. Um, you don't have control over what you wear. You don't have control over your hair and makeup. You don't have control over whether that thing, that job propels you to get other jobs or not. Mm. You have no control. And so there is a lesson that I needed to learn and that I think all actors need to learn, which is understanding all that all people, all yes. people, that you don't- This is so metaphorical. This is so good. I mean, that's great. There is a lesson that you need to learn that is you cannot control everything. Mm -hmm. So for me, the result of that lesson, first of all, it's crushing when you learn it and you are a person who really does need to need to have control it is crushing yes. you, because basically you have all this directional energy forward yes. and now it's just hitting a wall and you don't know what to do with that energy okay. you still have all of it exactly but people are saying like this is not the direction for it mm -hmm. so then you're like you kind of have this um, like crisis of identity and you have to figure out where you're going to put that control. So I can tell you that my kids and my husband, I, love you. I can tell you that they would tell you without knowing even what they were telling you that I put a lot of that energy into my house and my family and my family's lives and a lot of times that's too much mm -hmm. in there. Sometimes it's great because this house runs because I have all that energy. Exactly. The gets done as you and I were talking about before. Yeah, I was like, well, I kind of knew you were a control freak if you had to fold your laundry. Hand. Yes. Exactly. Yes. With but, the laundry, okay. the washer, the beds, the bathrooms, all the kids' extracurricular activities, the lunches, the dinners, making sure that there's, you know, protein in the freezer just in case, in case you know, somebody needs it just in case my freezer is full of protein to like last minute defrost whatever um but at the same time you can become a really oppressive mom mm -hmm. a really oppressive wife mm -hmm. just a really oppressive person and also you can't control other people really i can try mm -hmm. to but i can't control my husband he's a grown man yeah you can only guide Yes. Control. And even though, I mean, we shape our, your children are young. We shape yes. them yes. and guide them and we can control a younger child. Right. Uh, but I figure that backfires, right? Yes. Yes. Um, so even that is not an outlet for all of the controlling energy that I have. Mm -hmm. So then I would say to other people, other actors, other whatever, that you now need to find another outlet, mm -hmm. another way that you can have some control over something. And finding those areas for me has been the biggest life lesson, biggest challenge. And for me, that has come, I'm, st I'm still forming it. Yeah. I'm still coming up well, with it. I think that when, first of all, thank you for sharing that so openly and i think what you're describing um touches all successful people in That's general to know yeah because in order to be successful you put your whole heart and soul into anything yeah and the goal is to shape it to a level that it comes to fruition in the way that you see the product coming for product, meaning yourself, or product, meaning a, a physical product. Um, but my question is, is how do you take the word control and um, shift it to letting go? Um, I, I'm, I share this with you only because I know that I've had a lifelong journey with it as well. Yeah. Uh, well, there are two things. One is you kind of have to fake it until you make it. That's the first thing. So the first thing is that you realize that that control is not working. 
It's mm-hmm. not doing what you want. You're not getting what you want. You're not getting exactly what you want. You have, you actually have no control. First is the acknowledgement of knowing it's not working. Yes. yes. And so what you have to do is you have to be like, okay, I need to let go. How am I going to let go? And mm-hmm. there is a way where you can put that kind of like controlling focused energy towards letting go. Mm-hmm. So you do the meditation, you light the candles, you write in a journal, you have a mantra. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a rituals. Mm-hmm. So that it's just like you put it into practice. And it's a thing that you say, like, I have to let go. And then you start to realize the ways in which you're not letting it, letting go and you and you can see it and you can acknowledge it and be like, okay, let go. That is the awareness leads to good habits, right? Yes. yes. Rituals that then you are consistently reaffirming when you are and are not exhibiting the behavior. Exactly. Exactly. And perfectly said. It's oh, like well, you said it perfect. together, you said Sally. Perfectly. You said it perfectly. I was just describing what I was experiencing. Um, and I think that the other part of that is to really find those areas that fulfill you that do allow a little more control for example you doing this podcast Mm -hmm. absolutely yeah by the way the podcast if we want to talk about control came from the pandemic when i had no control and i had no freedom (laughs) therefore i immersed myself into more work so that i could basically avoid all the distractions in the household at the time so um absolutely and it's turned into the biggest gift because then i wouldn't have ever met sally Brethman. um i mean right back at you and that's me saying yes to doing podcasts and me saying yes to opportunities Mm -hmm. that come my way that are not just acting doors Mm -hmm. absolutely yeah i mean i think that the interesting thing is um we really are very multidimensional beings in the way that we have so many gifts and um, we're not meant, in my opinion, we're not meant to narrowly focus in just one thing forever. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, And who knows? I mean, maybe you could have this like amazing successful podcast or something else like it. It could be the next generation of whatever podcast is going to be, you know, that you're going to come up with. Yeah. and you want to be open and you want to be open to that um and not so myopic that the only thing you can see is that one area mm-hmm. you know that you're like okay i need to be creative i like to talk you know whatever the whatever the things are i like to talk to other women about this thing mm-hmm. i'm really interested in this thing and i think you're right like we are all multidimensional and the best thing that we can do for ourselves is lean into our multidimensionality and Mm -hmm. allow for and accommodate and support our own personal evolution through life yes it's so true because i mean i mean now that i know your children are so young i'm sure you see this in the world that you're living in right now that there are so many talented amazing women that do just harness all that beautiful energy that you're talking about into just their children. Yeah, yeah. That's not to say that if your dream, if your lifelong dream was to be a mother and that is where you want all your energy to go, great. But I think what you and I know and have seen is, and actually it's one of the reasons why I started Empower in the first place, or actually my first women's group, the Witty Group, is that there's so many amazing women that say they want to do something and don't step in. Yeah. What do you think stops them? Fear. Mm -hmm. Um, Fear, uh, discomfort. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I think that's it is like, we have no, we we don't know what that's going to, what that's going to look like. And we don't know um, what people are going to think of us if we do it. We don't know how people are going to react. Also, you know, as a mom, you can kind of like get into a routine where you've got everything under control, you know? 
you make the lunches, you drop the kids off, you come home, you clean up from breakfast, you clean up from making the lunch, you make everyone's bed, you do the laundry, you, um, you know, vacuum the floors, you go out to buy groceries, you come home, you take a shower, you know you should do something for yourself, so you read a book or you sit and you have your second cup of coffee, you take your dog for a walk, and oh, now it's time to pick the kids up. Yeah. You get back in the car, you pick them up, you go for one little extracurricular activity, you come home, you sit them down with their homework, you make the dinner, you serve the dinner, you eat the dinner, you clean yeah. up the dinner. You do It's very routine. And, 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 and it's filling, yeah. like it will fill your whole. Oh my God. Day. Yeah. It's never ending. And so yeah. then there becomes this thing where it's like, oh, well, I couldn't possibly do that thing. That's difficult and risky and unsure and uncertain because I mean, look, my day is so full. I couldn't possibly take time away from it. Mm -hmm. And yes. Yeah. sound like excuses to me. Right? It's, it totally excuses. And it's also easy. Mm, it's mm. easy and the excuses are not necessarily wrong, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, are you going to feel as fulfilled doing that whole day mm -hmm. as you would taking the risk that um, you're not taking? And I think the thing is there are some women who are like, that is my whole day. That's yeah. all I want. That's all I wanted from life. And like, great mm -hmm, totally that's so great and there is absolutely nothing wrong with that but there are some women as you mentioned who are like i'm just doing this because this is safe and i understand it mm -hmm. and i'm not doing this and mm -hmm. then when those kids graduate and they're no longer in your house what are you going to do well that's where courage comes in right yeah and challenging yourself to to try Right. And you can try more risk free, frankly, when your children are younger, even though we don't think we can always do that. We yeah. We dabble. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Versus it's suddenly so extreme when they're gone that you're yes. like, oh, my gosh, like, how am I going to do something? Right. But um, I have a question for you, Miss Actress. Um, what would you like if you could basically script your own role? What would it be? Like, is there something you've always wanted to be or do? Because you said, I have no control over those things, blah, blah, blah. Totally get it. But is there something you would really love to like play one role? So I'm going to answer this two ways. One, yeah. I am, as I, as I told you mm -hmm. privately off this podcast, yes. um, I am developing a show mm -hmm. that I do believe is like a dream role of mine. We're not going to talk about that now because it's in super early stages. But the next time I come back, once that thing has developed, yes, gone, there will be a part two. And we'll talk about it. And I'll be like, remember that thing I was talking about? Exactly. That but I often will sit and 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 I tell, I, I teach acting at the acting studio where David and oh, I are. Really? Okay, cool. Where um, it's called Leslie Kahn. She oh, yeah. is my teacher. She's my kid's godmother. She's where David and I met. Um, and I teach um, an acting class under her umbrella there. And I, you know, coach clients there as well. Very cool. Um, and what I will always tell my clients is I will say, look, if you're feeling stuck, if you're feeling like you don't have enough auditions or you're not booking or you're this or you're that, or you're just feeling stuck, sit down and write into words the exact roles that you want to play, the things that. that you want to play. So yeah. some people want to play doctors. Some people want to play lawyers. Some people are like, I'll play doctors and lawyers. Mm -hmm. For me- Those are two the most famous play. genres in TV. Yeah. <laughs> or, or you're like, I want to play a funny mom, whatever yeah. it is. Yeah. Um, for me, what I always wanted to, what I've always wanted for myself is, a vulnerable, mm. successful, funny, smart, and sexy woman. Sounds like you. Well, that's what I like to think of myself. Sounds like no, that's what we know of you. Well, thank you. The reason, the reason that I want it to be all of those things is because it's a little less true now, but in the course of history and entertainment, Women can't be all those things. I agree. Women haven't been all of those things. And so when I would try and pigeonhole myself into like, I want to be a lawyer, I was like, 
but I want to be a sexy lawyer and also a funny lawyer and also a lawyer who doesn't have her shit together all the time. Yeah. Basically, I I want to be a human woman. I want to be raw. Yes. You want to be a vulnerable human being that people, that it's accessible and people can relate to. And who has flaws and it's okay. And we watch her work through her flaws. Oh my God. Amen. And we watch her rise to success in spite of, and also because of her flaws. Mm -hmm. I love this because so often women are not allowed to be imperfect, right? Right. Nope. They don't allow themselves, right? But then in addition, they're not allowed, you know? And like you said, uh, you can neither be sexy or smart. You can be sexy and smart. Sexy and smart. Yeah. And by the way, we will top those gender norms as a young, I'm older than you are, but as a young person, like, you know, if you were going to be taken seriously, you couldn't wear like sexy heels to work. You had to wear like the other heels that were more conservative. Right. Yeah. 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 And you can't, and you definitely can't be smart and funny. No. I mean, the number of times. The the number, like most funny people are the smartest people, by the way. You have to be smart. That that timing, that thinking off the cuff. And the number of times that I've heard people be like, in this business, be like, the fact that you're pretty and funny, like that doesn't exist. And I'm like, yes, it does does you're like you're wrong hanging out with the wrong people uh but i was also like you're i'm sorry but you're limiting pretty people totally and also your idea of what is pretty is making oh, see, other, the other thing that's really disturbing yes what's really disturbing is that is like how people define pretty totally. in entertainment totally oh my god yes. yeah now we're, now we're really getting into it which is I, one of the reasons why i couldn't stay in entertainment yeah because i was like why everybody just wants something from you. I don't guess yes. like what happened to just like a, a kind exchange with people. Like, no, because that, that doesn't things. exist. That's not what it is. Yeah. It's more like you work there. Awesome. Like who do you know to get me a job? Yep. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But yeah. that's why only the truly strong and aligned survive. It's so true. It's so true. And, and I will say like at my, at the stage of my career right now, um, I've had so many people now tell me like friends of mine, be like, you just have to hold on, keep your mental sanity and wait for the next right part. Because mm-hmm. the number of people who are dropping like fl- like dropping like flies in their mental sanity and their ability to be hired for a job because they've just gone off the deep end because of how difficult this career yeah. is. They're like, you can separate yourself out from that pack just by staying mentally healthy. Uh, I would have to agree with you because there are a lot of mentally, um, there can be a lot of people that become mentally unstable, which actually leads me to another question. It takes a lot of confidence to, um, to coexist as an actress and to choose this path. And I know it was a calling for you and it, but how do you stay confident? I mean, in this time when you're saying like, I'm looking for this next right role. And we know that there's a lot of, there's a lot of confusion going on in the industry right now too, about how people get hired and all that stuff as well. Um, We don't need to get into that, but (laughs) that would be complicated. But I do wonder, like, how do you maintain your confidence? I don't. Mm. anyone who tells you that they do is lying mm. you can't you can't saying that. thank you for being honest 100 percent. you cannot you can regain it you can rebuild it but there is no question that every single person in this industry and i would hazard to guess that every single person everywhere Ugh, yeah has their confidence demolished absolutely and it's what makes us, it's what makes us human. It's what makes us stronger. Um, but it's really, it's your, it's, it's the level of confidence that you start. So if you have, if you start at a hundred and you get knocked down and you go to 70 and then you can rebuild yourself up to 90 and then you got knocked down. But if you're walking through life at a 20 and you get knocked down, you're at rock bottom. Exactly. You know? So you really do have to work to, um, in those high moments, 
acknowledge what's going on what's going on absolutely acknowledge how you feel acknowledge the signs that you're getting acknowledge the things that are coming your way that you feel very good about so that you can remember those and hold on to those and not see yourself as separate from those things when they're no longer there. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's helpful uh, for those that are measuring at a 20 to start, right? Yeah. Um, you know, what are some tools that the people that uh, lack the confidence, because I do believe that you probably were born confident. Um, yeah. yeah, and and so in which case, not everybody was right? right so how have you kind of guided some of these younger actresses that didn't have the opportunity that you had to start right yeah to come up come up from the 20 to the 70. um you need positive influences so for example i will see some like broken broken people mm -hmm. who like don't believe in themselves, don't believe that the business is gonna reward them, and yet here they are pursuing this thing. Mm -hmm. And it's not, I don't view that it's my job as their teacher or coach to knock those dreams. Mm -hmm. I'm not a Simon Cowell. I'm like a Paula Abdul on the original, mm -hmm. you know, American Idol. I'm like, I'm like, okay, I see you, and I see you not believing in yourself. Mm -hmm. I, and then I will, and then I will, for them be like, you signed up for this class. You did this um, this part of the assignment so well. This is amazing. Why, why are you holding yourself back from seeing the positive things? And so I will say to people who are lower on the confidence scale, make sure you have people in your life building you up. Like a network or a community. Yes. One and person can be a community. Totally. So clear. Yeah. One teacher. That's all you need. Your partner. That's all you need. Um, if you have people who are negatively coming at you, get rid of it. Get rid of it. Get rid of them because you are already not a confident person. You don't need any more people knocking you down. You're doing mm -hmm. all of that work for yourself. So get rid of all that toxicity, all that negativity, all those people bringing you down. You don't need it. And then with that support system, and yourself, you you need to um, list out, write out, say it out in your head, the positive things, the things you do like, the things you do love, the things that are going well for you, because you will attach to those things. Mm -hmm. If you're sitting there and, and repeating the negative things, I don't have this, I don't even have a manager, I don't have an agent, like I'm fat, I mm -hmm. my, I don't look like this, I, I need a nose job, I blah, 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 blah. That's all you're attracting. Yeah, and that's exactly. all you're Negative attracts negative. Yes, that's all you're perpetuating. And look, you're not gonna be able to fill yourself with positivity all the time, but when you do feel yourself drifting towards the negative, outweigh it with some positive stuff so that you can attach to that and you can lift yourself out of it. Yes, yeah. I think that's really great um, feedback. Yeah. And I think that it is so important to, um, to get clear. Yeah. Uh, because some people also, in my experience in entertainment, either um, like they out they uh, outlive their welcome. Does that make sense? They're yes. trying so hard to still make it work when they could find happiness and success somewhere else maybe sooner. Yes. Um, so this, which leads to my next question. If you weren't gonna stay in entertainment, what would you, where would you go? Like, is there a dream like outside of that? I'm yeah. sure there isn't because when- There you isn't, because if I were, honestly, if I were gonna do it and I tell my clients this all the time too, like. If you have another thing that you think you could do, go do it, mm -hmm. go do it. Because, and by the way, you don't even have to tell anyone that you're doing it and not doing this, exactly. go do it on the side. And then like, most likely you'll go to make plans to do that other thing. And then this will and this pick up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, I have to say, you've been such a wealth of information. And as per usual, since this is our third conversation, totally. we can actually talk forever. Forever. But I'm looking forward to having you on when you actually do produce your show with this amazing woman that is, I'm putting that into the universe, and I mean that, um, that uh, has all these multi-dimensions that are truly descriptive of who you are. 
Thank you so much. You're Thank a you. beautiful soul and um, just the light. You're full of kindness. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michelle. This has been so amazing and so um, like illuminating for me. I mean, you are terrific and your podcast is incredible. And I'm so honored to have been asked and, um, and be the first actress. I love it. Love You're it. Amazing. So one last question before we get off, because yeah. I do want people to know how they can find you. Yeah. Um, what are your top five core values? And My how do you top five core values, core values mm -hmm. um, honesty, mm -hmm. um, perseverance. I see that about you kindness, um, equality, mm. and um, fun. Yeah. Woo! I love fun. Me too. Gotta that's, have our next, that's our next stop with Lauren. Yes. Fun. Oh my gosh. Yes. When we get off, we'll talk about that. Absolutely. Well, why don't we let the audience know where they could reach you and where they can follow you on the gram or wherever else sure. they, they should be. Um, uh, I am on Instagram, Sally P R eight one. Um, I also have a TikTok, Sally Pressman, and I've been trying to do that in a way that, um, doesn't make me crazy. So Yes. Um, Meaning like that you're not on it every five minutes. That I'm not on it every five minutes, that I'm not perseverating over likes and follows and blah, 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 and blah, 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 and not making myself feel bad about things. So that sounds yeah. pretty healthy. Trying, trying, working. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> Confidence. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. All right. Well, thank you so much again. And yeah. I look forward to uh, chatting with you again soon. Have a wonderful thank day. You too. Thanks.